Hi, my name's Will. Let's all put on our tinfoil hats and get ready for the robot apocalypse. In Ex Machina, we see how easily humans can be fooled by digital superintelligence. And the movie serves as a bit of a warning of how we could be left behind by whatever forms of artificial general intelligence we create. So in this video, we'll be running through the philosophical basis of how technologies like Neuralink can actually protect us from a lot of the horrors posed by these kinds of doomsday scenarios. There's no shortage of movies that show robots and artificial general intelligence, or AGI, having goals misaligned with what we would like them to value, leading to all sorts of doomsday scenarios. In iRobot, for example, the AGI is governed by three laws. One, don't harm human beings. Two, obey orders from humans unless it violates rule one and harms them. And three, which is a little less important, the robot must protect its own existence as long as it doesn't violate rules one and two. So pretty specifically, just following rules one and two, the robots round up all humans and try to restrict their freedoms on the basis of preventing them from coming to harm as a result of their own actions. I mean, that's pretty in line with what those rules are. Don't harm humans and obey orders from humans unless it harms them. So if humans are harming themselves, just stop them from doing that. These kinds of problems are called value alignment problems, which is one of the many threats posed by AGI that public figures like Elon Musk haven't been shy of warning the public about. Despite this, Musk has unveiled his plans for Neuralink, which seems like it's taking us one step closer to an AGI populated future. I mean, what Neuralink does is develop on existing brain machine interface technology and they're trying to create what's essentially a wireless connection between our brains and digital technology. While my own paranoia makes me think of potential glitches that can come up with developing this kind of tech, there's a deeper goal that Neuralink accomplishes that I think people should be aware of before they're quick to react on some fears about AGI in general. Where the deeper value of Neuralink lies, in my opinion, is almost as an insurance policy against these kinds of doomsday scenarios. Neuralink and similar kinds of technology which are actually out there could honestly be the only reason that human minds exist one million years from now. I should quickly preface this entire discussion by mentioning that I'm by no means an expert in the technical side of Neuralink and we'll be looking at the big picture implications of this kind of tech. And on a different note, there will be spoilers for the movie Ex Machina. Well, let's get into it. Okay, so in Ex Machina, the main character Caleb has been brought to his CEO's ranch to determine whether or not the robot that's been developed is not just capable of human-like behavior, but whether or not she's able to form genuine thoughts and truly experience consciousness. So despite developing feelings for the robot Ava and helping her escape from her confines, she does not take Caleb with her and eventually leaves him at the end of the movie to die. So the scary thing here was that Caleb was convinced to at least some extent she was conscious, but the deeper problem is that both he and us as the viewer don't really know if she's truly conscious or just running on code without any internal experience. So as things progress, one thing we have to answer for is should we make AGI conscious? Not should they seem conscious like Ava in the movie, but should they actually be conscious and have their own internal experience like a human, a dog or a bat? So to help answer this, think of two different worlds. You've basically got one populated with humans like us who are conscious, and another world populated by humans who are living and performing their daily functions like us, but they're completely unconscious, sort of like a computer processing a Google search. In this world, they would be completely devoid of any internal experience. So most of us think it's better to have a world populated by the conscious humans. Now, there are quite a few reasons why someone would choose that option, but a lot of the time their reason for doing so would be based on the idea that a world of conscious humans presents the possibility or even likelihood for those conscious humans to have an overall positive experience. So when we're answering the question, should we make AGI conscious? If we're gonna say yes, there's probably some sense that 
If we wanna make them conscious, it would be because we think they're able to experience something positive. I mean, if any response to that question was to be, sure, let's make AGI conscious, but that person didn't care if the new consciousness constantly experienced a level of suffering equal to, say, torture, you would probably rule out taking seriously any response to any question from that person. They would probably just be an all-round shit person. So, if we were to say that we should make robots conscious, because it's possible they would come to have an overall positive experience, then we have to answer the question, how do we make robots conscious? And more importantly, we better know how to make robots conscious to prevent the possibility of accidentally bringing them into consciousness in instances where the experience they would go through would be negative. Actually, if we don't do this, we could be responsible for bringing about a whole new type of consciousness that only experiences suffering. So, the most likely way to solve the question, how do we make AGI conscious, would be to work backwards and figure out how humans or even animals become conscious. And what this requires, in my opinion, is for us to solve what's been persisting in philosophy called the hard problem. The hard problem is essentially the question, why do conscious things have a type of experience? For example, you have a type of experience. There's something that it's like to be you. So why is there something that it is like to be inside the head of a human or a dog? That's really the essence of the hard problem. But another way to put it would be, how and why do the physical processes in the brain give rise to the subjective experiences of the mind. So even with animals, we say that they're conscious because we believe, and we can't know this, but we believe that they have a type of experience. So sure, a dog may not have a good sense of sight, but their sense of smell would be far stronger than ours. And the information processing capabilities in their brain probably wouldn't be as complex as ours. But all of this would alter how their brain interfaces with the external world. So we could say that dogs experience the world in a different way than us humans do, but they do have their own internal experience of the world. This isn't something we could say for a table. And it's because of this that we're inclined to say that dogs are conscious. Ultimately, for something to be conscious, we have to believe that inside their head, some sort of internal experience is playing out. So the first half of solving the hard problem would be to figure out a scientific explanation for how consciousness comes into existence. So what we'd have to figure out is how consciousness arises from purely physical processes. To oversimplify this part of the hard problem, it would basically be coming up with the recipe for consciousness. The second half of solving the hard problem of consciousness gets a little deeper. This part of the hard problem asks why consciousness arises from only physical processes. So let's say scientists come up with an explanation or formulation that resulted in consciousness. This still wouldn't really explain why consciousness emerged. So whatever ingredients you finally find out result in consciousness, even a full theory explaining its mechanisms will still leave the emergence of consciousness as a mystery. So what does this mean for AGI? The most mysterious part of the hard problem is why physical processes lead to our subjective experience of the world. But this philosophically troubling part of the hard problem may not be the most important part of the hard problem when it comes to AGI. Maybe we shouldn't be looking at why physical processes lead to our subjective experience of the world, but we should be looking at the first question of which physical processes lead to our subjective experience of the world. It's probably more pressing that we come up with this recipe for consciousness giving the rate of progress with AGI, even if this would only get us part of the way to an answer for the hard problem. More importantly, if we're able to come up with an answer to this part of the hard problem, we can stop ourselves from accidentally creating new forms of consciousness that end up experiencing a significant amount of suffering. Experts in artificial general intelligence generally predict that we'll create proper AGI by anywhere from 2030 to 2050, with very few expert predictions of this milestone going beyond the end of this century. So this is really the timeline of when we'd need a solution by to prevent the kind of suffering we've been speaking about. Now, 
David Chalmers, the philosopher who actually came up with the term hard problem, said he'd be surprised if there was a consensus on the hard problem within this 20 to 30 year timeline. And more realistically, we'd be lucky if we had a consensus within 100 years. All of these numbers are pretty speculative, but just the timelines that are being discussed make it look like AGI will emerge significantly earlier than our solution to the hard problem, which is scary. And that's the value of Neuralink. Neuralink and similar technologies have the potential to link our consciousness to some AGI that's developed. So it can act as a pathway to making AGI conscious. But I think with um, a high bandwidth brain machine interface, I think we can actually go along for the ride. And even in the instances that some disastrous AGI apocalypse occurs, Neuralink could be the link between machine and consciousness that prevents a world filled with unconscious robots. Going back to the first question of this video, which was, would it be better to have a world filled with conscious humans or a world filled with humans with no conscious experience? It's technologies like Neuralink that could ensure we end up in a world with an overall positive and conscious experience. So sure, we may not have our bodies, which is pretty bad, but I'd say an AGI apocalypse with Neuralink would be a lot better than an AGI apocalypse without it. This video hasn't really run through some of the risks posed by this kind of tech, but hopefully you understand the potential upside of this kind of technology. And for those of us who are a little more paranoid about the risks posed by AGI, this might actually be something that even we can appreciate. So I hope you enjoyed the video and got something out of it. It's a bit of a departure from the content I'm normally putting up, but the philosophical reasons Elon has for working on Neuralink are really quite interesting, especially for someone who's so wary of AGI's risks. So thanks for watching. I'd be really interested in how you feel about Neuralink, especially now while it's in its early stages. So let me know what you think in the comments and I'll see you in the next video.